Anthology presents Professor Challenger at the Edge of Eternity by Robert Thomas and Darren Freebury Jones, based on characters created by Arthur Conan Doyle. Part 1 Seek Ye Challenger. It was on the last breath of a dying colleague of mine, a journalist named Malone who coincidentally was the author of a number of tall tales, that I was carried from the rain-drenched, smog-shrouded streets of London to the vast plains of Africa, and thereafter was whisked away on the greatest adventure of my life. That evening, in the cool April of 1922, had begun like any other. I had returned from the opera, having dined with an old school chum of mine and his wife, who had tried to play matchmaker with a woman whom they considered I should make a good suitor. Teresa, with her auburn hair, pleasant perfume, and swelling bosom, had rather charmed me, and lest I recognize my inability to succumb to a dreamless sleep, and, having bid each other a good night at the door of my cab, I retired to my study in the hopes of completing a portfolio required by my editor before dawn. At that time I was a journalist for the Daily Gazette, and one who has spent a great many years enduring the climb up the slippery slope to becoming one of the most respected foreign correspondents of our time. I had unsheathed my fountain pen, and had scarcely put pen to paper, when I heard the crash of fists against the rain-specked window pane. What the devil could that be at this hour? The sound had scared me half to death, so having been spurred into action by my failing bladder, I rose cautiously to investigate. Hello? I say, man, quite the hour to be playing practical jokes on a chap. You've scared me half to death. Is that you, Wilkins? Well, if you're expecting to see Teresa in this house with me, then you'll find you're quite mistaken. She made it clear she isn't that type of girl. I fell back in shock as the window combusted, and a sodden man fell into the study. Books were ruined all about me, and so were my trousers. I crawled away as the figure craned his neck towards me. His opium-fevered eyes bore into my soul. His beard, matted and sopping, clung to his face, and his skin wore the torment of travel, and had leathered in the sun. The edge of eternity! The edge of eternity! It took me a moment to realize who he was. He was my old colleague from the Gazette, Edward Malone. He had come to some prominence when he published a short novella about his supposed discoveries in South America. But they were all fanciful tales, surely. Nevertheless, last I had heard he was abroad, having become obsessed with some spiritualist cult or other, and certainly was not in London, much less in my study. He crawled towards me, clutching at my pyjamas. Philip, my dear Philip Peregrine, the edge of eternity! I helped him to a chair and poured him a stiff drink. Drink this whiskey, old man. Easy now. Edward, it is you. What the devil are you doing here? The edge of eternity. Philip, Philip. My dear man, you must tell me what has happened to you. He pulled my face closer to his. The acrid scent of death hung about him like a foul wind upon a sudden port. In his hand he held a key, which he forced into my palm, squeezing it tight so that in fact it hurt. I assure you was no mean feat for a man so exhausted that he was quite literally about to die. You must find Challenger. Philip, the edge of eternity, you must find Challenger. Alone? My dear man, are you alone? He was dead. I ran to my writing desk and tore the words onto paper. Professor Challenger and the Edge of Eternity. Well, it meant nothing to me. I'd heard of Challenger, however, 
understood him to be the bullish, one may say, protagonist of Malone's account, and I knew him to be held in some disrepute in the scientific community. Some said he'd gone mad, disappeared into the depths of Africa, never to return. A colleague had claimed to have seen him, the whites of his eyes glistening in the dark haze of an opium den in Cairo some years before. He was more myth now than man. I wondered, why should an adventurer thought long dead be the dying words of someone who I assumed was simply a passing acquaintance? The next morning I resolved to come to some sort of understanding around what this edge of eternity was. I sought out an old colleague of mine, the former editor of the Gazette and now a part-time curate of the British Museum, Mr. McCarthy. Yes, good morning, Philip. <laughs> Quite a storm last night, eh? Hello, Mr. McArdle. Quite. Good Lord, man. You look as though you've seen a ghost. Is everything all right? I had an unusual evening, Mr. McArdle. Do you remember Edward Malone? Edward Malone? Oh, of course I do. His story of the dinosaurs in South America was very exciting nonsense. <laughs> it shifted quite a number of issues when I was still editor of the Gazette. <laughs> Isn't he on the continent at some conference or other to do with his spiritual tosh? Hmm? He may well have been on the continent, Mr. McArdle, but I can assure you that as of midnight last night, he is very much in my study very much dead. I had not had time to remove him from the study, so propping him up in a chair I had retired to bed, in the hopes that perhaps a good night's sleep would clear my head and allow me time to collect my thoughts around what exactly to do with a corpse. Oh dear. Well, that must have been something of a surprise. It was, rather. But he said the damnedest thing as he expired, and I just can't get my head around it. Well, go on, man. He was mumbling about the edge of eternity. McArdle was rather taken back. The edge of eternity? I have to say, I'm rather taken aback by this. My lord, it, it can't be. What? Could it be that the old fool has found it? What? The edge of eternity, man. Have you never heard of it? Well... No, actually... What else did Malone say? Did he say what it was? The only other utterance he made was of Professor Challenger. George Challenger? That old crack pot. I thought he was dead. It would appear that even if he is, he has something to do with this malarkey. You must go to Africa at once. I couldn't believe what he was saying. I beg your pardon. I can't believe what you're saying, Mr. McArdle. Philip, the edge of eternity has been discovered. You, you must heed Malone's words. You must go and find Professor Challenger. I must. Indeed. I, I, I shall book you the next steamer out of Dover. You will? Indeed. You'll be in Cairo in mere days. That is where Challenger was last seen. It shouldn't take you long to find him from there. After all... If Malone's stories are anything to go by, then he's quite a bullish, ugly man. Right. Leave everything with me. I will make all of the arrangements. Mr. McArdle, what on earth is going on? No time to explain, old man. I have to book you those ferry tickets. McArdle did as he said. And that evening, I was stood on the platform at Paddington. A suitcase in my hand and my coat pulled tightly around me as another storm opened up around London. I bid my darling Teresa farewell, with fear in my heart that I should never see her again. Even though I had really only met her the once, and on reflection she had been rather annoying, what with her habit of cracking knuckles and tittering all the time like a nudist sitting on a bed of feathers, and yet... There was something about her that I just couldn't pin down. Goodbye, my love. I fear I shall never see you again. My darling Philip, though we've known each other for but a few hours, they seem like a lifetime. 
I shall never give up hope that you may actually come back from Africa alive and perhaps return a rich man. I wouldn't count on it. Find our fortune, my love. I shall wait for you every day. I'm not a particularly material man, my dear. I have enough to get by. Comfortable lodgings Plunder and... the diamond mines of Africa with me in your heart, my love. I won't be going to any diamond mines. Farewell. Mind. I hated to see her leave, but I loved to watch her walk away. Then, somewhat energised, I climbed aboard the train like a wizard wrestling with an impromptu magic wand and settled into my carriage. Alas, I was sharing with an American man, and as a respectful British gentleman, it was my duty to hate him to his very core. Theodore Harrison, my good man, pleased to make your acquaintance. I was not pleased to make his acquaintance. And you are? My name is Philip Peregrine, sir. Okay, Phil, it's great to meet you. It was not great to meet him. Where are you headed? I'm booked on a steamer from Dover, bound for Cairo. That so? I'm heading to Cairo myself. I'm on a job for the New York History Museum of uh, Antiquities. That is quite interesting, I assure you. I lied. I found it terribly dull. What business do you have in Cairo, Mr. Harrison? Theo, please. Well, it's a funny story, actually. It was no rib tickler. I've been hired by the curator of the New York History Museum, or the NYHM to engage the services of a well-known explorer to help track down his son and daughter-in-law, who vanished without trace in the African veldt some time ago. How interesting. I wasn't interested at all. Who is the explorer whose services you wish to engage? Why, his name is Alan Quatermain. I've heard he's the best man in Africa for the job. How amusing. I too am going to Cairo to engage the services of an explorer whose exploits have been published in literature. Well, what a small world. Who are you going to recruit for your services, Phil? None of your business. The next three hours were incredibly awkward, as not another word was exchanged between the two of us. Soon, however, we had arrived at the port, and I was safely tucked away in my bed in my cabin, away from the prying Yankee doodle doos and their frighteningly dull conversation. Unfortunately, and rather coincidentally, I was next door to Theodore Harrison, who I was finding dull as lavatory water. Come in. Well, if it isn't Phil Peregrine. I'm sorry to bother you, but do you mind if I borrow some toothpaste? I minded very much. However, he had soon brushed his teeth, and we saw no more of each other for the rest of the journey. It was all rather uneventful and not worth wasting our time discussing, but I must make note of a rather delicious serving of Moules Mariniers, and encourage anyone who travels with the Peninsula and the Oriental Steam Navigation Company in the future to make liberal use of their unrivaled French cuisine. At last, however, I had arrived at my destination. Cairo lay before me. The minarets spearing the sky. Good afternoon, Effendi, and welcome to the Cairo Hotel. Hello, I'm checking in. Salam, sir. Uh, what is your name? Philip Peregrine. Now, Mr. Peregrine, you have booked a budget room with us for a one budget night. Budget? Uh, one night? Yes, sir. Your booking made it very clear. As cheap and short as possible was what it said on the telegram. I see. Very well. I wonder, could you tell me where the nearest opium den is? I had rather thought that this question, coming from a gentleman as respectable as myself, would both shock and confuse the hotel manager, rendering him unable to respond until he had sufficient time to return from being taken aback. There are a great many in Cairo, Effendi. What type of opium are you looking for? Alas, it was I who was surprised. What do you mean, what type? There are many different types. I see. Fascinating. I collected my thoughts. I was, after all, here on business rather than pleasure. 
I'm actually here on business rather than pleasure. I'm looking for a man who I believe may be tucked away in an opium den. Who are you seeking? Professor George Edward Challenger, but uh, I consider it most unlikely that you would have heard of... Professor Challenger can be found in Abdul's Delhi, an opium den, a few minutes' walk from this very hotel, sir. Shall I have your bags taken to you? Yes, please. I took in the sights of Cairo. The city of a thousand minarets was glowing in the blood-orange wash of the setting sun, which now crept beneath the great towering pyramids and sent fiery ripples dancing across the Nile. A light breeze had caught the palm trees and hissed across my brogues. Soon, however, I found myself in Abdul's Delhi and Opium Den. It was not hard to find, as a plume of opium smoke was billowing from the doorway. I ventured inside. Excuse me, sir. Terribly sorry to bother you. Where can I find Professor Challenger? The dragon. The dragon. I see. Undeterred, I approached another gentleman. Excuse me. You there, man. Where can I find Professor Challenger? The dragon. The dragon. It wasn't going very well. I'd had half a mind to give up and go back to London to marry Teresa and forget about this whole edge of eternity business. I was out of my comfort zone enough as it was. But then... I couldn't put my finger on what it was about Teresa that seemed off, and after all, she had encouraged me to find my fortune in the diamond mines of Africa before returning home. I thought it was worth one more try. Excuse me, sir. I'm looking for Professor Challenger. I am George Edward Challenger. He was completely naked, apart from a carefully placed loincloth. Oh, completely naked? Apart from a carefully placed loincloth. Yes. Very stoned. Of course. Then you must be Challenger. My God, man, it is good to see you, and alive to boot. I thought you were to be dead, deader than your former companion, who still lies dead in my study. I must get the cleaners in. Those were but lies spread by my competitors. What can I do for you, Demon of the Smoke? Demon of the... I beg your pardon. I'm sorry. I'm very, very high. Not to worry, Professor. George, please. George, I need you to help me. My name is Philip Peregrine of the Daily Gazette. I have come bearing the dying words of Edward Malone. He says you know something about the edge of eternity. Malone? Dead? Can it possibly be? After all of our adventures... Could it be he, cautious old Malone, who was the first to journey into the great unknown, the final adventure? How did he die? I had rather hoped you'd know the answer to that. No. No. But in time, in time I shall avenge his killers, spraying them with my furious retribution, covering them in my hot, unslaked vengeance. In the meantime, the edge of eternity. My goodness, demon. What else was it that Malone said? Nothing, really. Just some gurgling and some painful death noises. Sort of like that. I see. We must leave at once. There is no time to lose. Stay where you are, Challenger. Theo, it would seem, had come looking for Quartermain in the same place that I had found Challenger. I was rather annoyed as he had stopped our progress dead, and on top of it all, I found him terribly dull. At last, Challenger. I'll finally put an end to you, and the edge of eternity will be all mine. I'll hand over the key of destiny. Or I'll blow you away, the same way I blew away your part-time lover, Edward Malone. I beg your pardon? Harrison, you slimy bastard. You killed Edward Malone, eh? And for what? A chance of claiming the edge of eternity for your own, I suppose. You're goddamn right I did. And I intend to finish the job. There is nothing, 
you can do to stop me. Now hand over the key of destiny before I'm forced to pry it out of your cold, dead hands. This had been a shocking turn of events. As I stood, knees knocking together, the nearly naked Professor Challenger wobbling his tackle at the gun-toting, actually rather villainous and not dull at all Theodore Harrison, I wondered... Would I ever know what the edge of eternity was? Would I ever get back home? Would I ever see my beloved Teresa again? And most of all, would Professor Challenger ever put on some proper trousers? Professor Challenger at the Edge of Eternity starred Robert Durbin as Philip Peregrine, Darren Freebury Jones as Professor Challenger, James Lawrence as Theodore Harrison, Alid Bidder as Malone, Robert England as McArdle, and Evelyn Campbell as Teresa. You've been listening to an anthology production written and directed by Robert Thomas and Darren Freebury-Jones.